Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Yes, we're to f clothe the, the naked and feed the poor. We're to watch out for the widows and orphans. We're to visit those who are in prison. All of those are things we're supposed to do. But listen, if you do those things and you don't proclaim the gospel, you can help someone with a temporary need only to, to leave them alienated from God eternally. We must proclaim the word. Oh. Happy Friday! In today's broadcast, we have part two of Pastor Sam's message entitled, Jesus is Alive, The Rest of the Story. This is our final broadcast in the book of Luke, considering the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection and before his ascension. Thank you for joining us through this wonderful book, and we look forward to taking you through the Gospel of John, which is next. So, let's listen in. Eight days, by the way, would go by before Jesus appears to these guys again. First time Thomas wasn't with them. He was AWOL, doesn't say where he was or why he wasn't there, but we know he wasn't there. And when the disciples tell Thomas, we've all seen him. He says, I'm not going to believe unless I can see the wounds and put my hands into him. He's sort of like, I got to handle them or I won't believe it. Well, I, I'm intrigued by the fact that Jesus tells the others, handle me and see. He understands it was a lot to ask. They didn't recognize him. They struggled to believe it was really him. They wanted to believe it, but they struggled to believe it. So eight days later, Thomas shows up and, and he's with the disciples. And, and this takes us back again to John 20. So if you'd go over there for a moment with me, John 20, 26, as eight days have gone by, Thomas now with the disciples, Jesus came, the doors being shut, similar situation, he stood in the midst. He says, as he had a week earlier, peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Two things about this particular um, section. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. It's so important. There are some who will say, well, Jesus never claimed to actually be God, just the son of God or an ambassador of God. No, Jesus claimed to be God. In fact, his enemies fully grasp that. That's one reason they would try to kill him. And they did numerous times. They failed, of course, until it came to the cross. Why? Because the Old Testament had already prophesied it would be like that. But, but, but here's the point. If Jesus were not God, he would have told Thomas, hey, the Lord thinks cool, but don't call me God. Why? No one is to be worshiped as God, but God. And Jesus is the son of God and God the son. So Thomas says, my Lord and my God, Again, it's not enough to believe he's the Lord or even that he's God. He needs to be your Lord and your God. The other issue here is he says, blessed are those who've not seen and believed. And that is a blessing of beatitude pronounced on us with, um, well, I would say with few exceptions and maybe with none. Uh, most of us would say, hey, I, I've never seen him, not, not, not in reality, and, 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 but, but I believe. I believe because of his word. I believe because he's spoken my name, because he's opened my eyes, because he's walked with me and opened the scriptures to me. Oh, that's what was happening with them, you see. So, so now we, we come to John 21. We skip ahead a little. We're in John. We'll find our way back in a few moments to, to um, Luke 24. But as followers of Jesus, we're going to see that we are to be engaged primarily in the ministry of proclamation, preaching that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again, sharing the good news of the gospel and the ministry of restoration. Yes, we're to clothe the, the naked and feed the poor. We're to watch out for the widows and orphans. We're to visit those who are in prison. All of those are things we're supposed to do. But listen, if you do those things and you don't proclaim the gospel, you can help someone with a temporary need only to, to leave them alienated from God eternally. We must proclaim the word. And our ministry is one of restoration, not just preaching to those who don't know, but restoring those who've fallen, who do know. And we get to see that here. Jesus has no doubt privately restored Peter at this point. 
but he's going to publicly restore him. Why? His desires for, his intentions for Peter haven't changed at all. Peter failed him, but there's no plan B when it comes to Jesus' plan for Peter's life. He's going to use him and he's going to use him radically, dramatically. And, and so this is his story of restoration. We read in John 21, 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Track with this a moment. Before we get to the end of this, he's going to say this is the third time he's appeared to these disciples. So he appears to them without Thomas, eight days later to them with Thomas. Now they're not in Jerusalem. They're down in Galilee. And he appears to them there. It's something I hadn't noticed, but it, it seems important today. And that is, it's not like Jesus was showing up every single day to meet with these guys. We learn from 1 Corinthians 15 that for 40 days, Jesus was making appearances, but apparently not only to them. Why? Once he'd convinced them and recommissioned them, now it's all about finding others and doing the same. So, Peter's there, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we're going with you also. So they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. It's a simple reminder. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. Does anybody believe that though? I, I mean, I know you're going to say, oh yeah, we, we do. He says it, of course we believe it. But I've noticed we try to do a whole lot of things and we fail and then we wonder, why didn't that work? Because if it's not his work in us and through us, it's not going to be fruitful now that we've surrendered our lives to him. We just can't go back to what we used to do, even if we were successful at it. And if you don't believe without him, you can do nothing. Well, listen, there are only two ways to learn that lesson. Learn it by hearing it and believing it, or you'll learn it the hard way. And, and, and so either way, you will learn. Apart from him, nothing. Now, I can do all things we also read in Scripture through Christ Jesus, who strengthens me. And it's relatively simple. He tells me what to do. I obey him. And whatever he wants to accomplish through me, it's going to happen. And that's what happens here. He's on the shore. They're out fishing. They haven't caught anything. And, and it says when morning had come, verse four, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they said, no. I kind of like how he asked the question. He didn't say, you catching anything? That's just a bummer to ask a fisherman who hasn't, you know, but he goes, you guys got anything to eat? And they're like, no. And he said, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Uh, again, this caused my buddy Gail Irwin to quip, how big was that boat? I mean, it's like they've been fishing all night. Now he's just saying, throw the net on the other side. And as they do, it's going to work. Why? It's what he's telling them to do. And there will always be a test. God tells us what he wants. We begin to process, does that make sense? Or we just shouldn't even ask the question. If we know he's talking to us, we should just do what he says. And, and of course, that will always lead to success. So cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. This is John, by the way, telling Peter, hey, this is the Lord. And I would suggest if the nets are full, it's the Lord. If in a time where people are laid off and you have plenty of work, it's the Lord. At a time where people are struggling and suffering, if you have reasonable health or you're very healthy, it's the Lord. We should give him the glory for every blessing in our life. And even those things we don't understand, they often turn out to be blessings, knowing that all things are working together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. So, the point here is, he says, you got anything? They said, no. He says, cast the net on the side and you will. They do. And John gets it. It's got to be the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he'd removed it. He plunged into the sea and the other disciples, they, they, they came in the little boat for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits, cubit about 18 inches. So you can do the math. They're dragging the net with fish. As soon as they'd come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. Now take note of this. It's important. It's significant. We'll come back to it. They come and there's a fire of coals. There's fish laid on it. There's bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. I love that he says that. Bring some of those fish you guys caught. Listen, they weren't going to catch anything. And all they did was obey him. And now they have this huge catch of fish. 
John recognizes it's the Lord. I hope you recognize that, that God's grace is way beyond the grace that saved us or sustains us, but, but he gives us things he wants us to do. He tells us to do them. He enables us making them possible. And then when we get to heaven, do you know he is going to reward us for the very things he did through us. And, and it's just the ultimate sign and, and seal of his grace. It's his work from beginning to end, his work for us on the cross, his work in us as he transforms us, his work through us as, as we obey him. And then we get to heaven and he goes, here's your stuff. And we're like, whoa, what did I ever do for all that, Lord? Don't think it will be the other way around. Nobody's gonna be in heaven saying, hey, where's all my stuff? After all, I did so much. No, we're going to say, well, when did I see you hungry and feed you? When did I see you naked and clothe you? When did I see you in prison and visit you? And he's going to say, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Not only does he see what we're doing, not only does he see when we're obeying, but he promises to reward every good work. Well, Peter went and dragged up the net to land. And I like this. He swims in. They get it almost all the way there. Then he's like, here, I'll take that. And, you know, he pulls it all in for them. And, and uh, it's full of large fish, 153, though there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. This suggests, again, they don't recognize him, not visually, not physically, but they certainly recognize that, hey, we've been through this before. This has got to be the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. And this was the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. It's interesting if you read commentaries, and I highly recommend the commentaries we have in the bookstore. There are many other good ones, but we try to basically stock commentaries by sane people and who know the Lord and believe the word. And, and there are some, I don't think we have them in the bookstore, although it's possible if you find them, tell me and we'll get them out. But, but uh, there are some who've suggested that Jesus is actually asking Peter, do you love me more than fish? Now, it just doesn't make any sense because Peter never boasted that he loved Jesus more than fish. It's easy to love Jesus more than fish. I mean, I like fish, but I love Jesus. And, and, and here's the deal. Peter had boasted that he loved Jesus more than the others. And if you're saying, I don't remember that. Well, maybe not word for word, but when he says, hey, I know they're going to forsake you because the word says it and you say it, but I'll never forsake you. That's Peter saying, I love you more than they do. That, that I'll stick by you no matter what. That, Lord, you may think you know us, but, but you don't know me. And the truth is Jesus knew them all and he knew Peter well. So Peter had boasted he would never forsake the Lord. He'd ended up denying the Lord three times. You know the story. And so Peter asked him, or, or Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other disciples? That's what he's asking. And Peter doesn't say, you know, I love you more than they do. I think he would have said that before his fall. But he says, Lord, you know, I love you. Yes, Lord, you know, I love you. He doesn't say more than them, but he says, you know that I love you. And so Jesus says, feed my lambs. And by the way, if you love the Lord today, I would think you do, or why else be here? He, he's saying feed his lambs. If you have kids, those are Jesus' lambs. They grow up fast, believe me, faster than you can believe. And if you have two in diapers or three or four and they're all under five and you're thinking they ain't growing up fast, I just like every day is like 48 hours long. And, and, and uh, no, listen, it will pass so quickly. And, and you mainly hear this from white haired people, but, but we've got some wisdom and experience. And, and, and so I want to encourage you, if you have them, the little lambs, feed those lambs. Invest in them spiritually. Nothing will be more important to you later. So nothing should be more important to you now. And then he said a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. So feed my lambs tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed 
my sheep. Now it said Peter was grieved that he said to him the third time. And there are a couple reasons for this. First of them, I believe, is, is very obvious and simple. Where was Peter when he denied the Lord? He was at the enemy's fire. Where is he now? He's sitting at a coal of fire. And, and you know, images like that, they have a way of bringing back those last time or other times where you've been in a similar situation. And so no doubt Peter's having a little bit of a deja vu. And, and it's one of those things where Jesus is bringing it up because he really wants Peter to deal with it, to put it away, to know it's truly forgiven and forgotten. He wants the other disciples to know the same. So he's at the coals of fire. And even as he denied the Lord three times, now the Lord gives him three times to affirm his love for him. And that's exactly what he's doing. But it said he was grieved when he said the third time. Now, another reason for this is a little more subtle. It's in the language of the original documents. Jesus uses a word when he says, do you love me, that we're well familiar with. It's, it's the word agape. It's the word for God so loved the world. He loved the world, agape, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It speaks of an unconditional sacrificial love. And so Peter is being asked by our Lord, do you love me like that sacrificially, unconditionally, more than these other disciples love me? And Peter doesn't say, you know, I love you more than them. He doesn't even say, I agape you, Lord. He says, I, I philos you or uh, phileo or, or, or it, it's, there are various forms of the word looking at how it's used, but, but it all comes down to this. Eros speaks of erotic or sensual physical love. Phileo speaks of our, our brotherly love, our common affection, our family love. And, and then agape speaks of that perfect love that God demonstrates toward us and wants us to share with one another. We need to know he is the only source of that kind of love, though. So that's why it's essential we're abiding in him if we want to bear that kind of fruit. So he says, do you love me unconditionally, sacrificially, perfectly? And Peter says, well, I'm really fond of you, Lord. I really have a lot of affection for you. And I like that. He's just being honest. And, and that's all the Lord's asking for many of us. You know, I, I got a buddy I went to high school with. Some of you've heard him. His name's Leo Giovanetti. We, we actually met in 1967. We played in the bars with phony IDs before we were old enough to be in the bars. And, and now we're both pastoring, which is a miracle in and of itself. But in the early years of our Christian experience together, he had a band called the Agape Brothers and I played bass in it for a while. And I told him at one point, Leo, I got to break off. And he's like, why? I go, I just can't claim this Agape thing anymore. I mean, I'm reading John and, and he's like, he's all about this. So I'm going to break off and start the filet brothers and uh, first CD filet of soul you know and get back into my roots and but anyway that's sort of a joke but not completely uh, we had conversations like this which tells you a lot about how weird we were and are even as Christians and if you get down to San Diego by the way Mission Valley Christian Fellowship Leo Giovanetti look him up you won't be disappointed but Jesus asked Peter, you know, is that the kind of love you have for me? And Peter doesn't say I love you more or I love you perfectly. He just says, I have all the affection that, that I can for you, Lord. And he asked him a second time, the same question, the same words are used. And then he asked him the third time. And, and it said he was grieved the third time because, well, Jesus comes down to Peter's word. And I think it's an important question for us to ponder today. We, we wouldn't be so foolish as to say, I have perfect love for you, Lord. I want to. But, but what he's really asking Peter at this point, and I think he would be asking us as well, is your affection for me primary? And in other words, do, do, you, have, do you really have affection for me? Or, or is it spread a, abroad? And, 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 and here's why this is so important. Our love for him has to be so great that, that our love for others, well, it pales in comparison. Now, don't worry, you'll be a better husband, a better father, or a better mother, and, and, and a better child, a, a better friend. If Jesus is first, if he's on the throne, if your love for him is primary, well, he'll be a source of love that you can pass on to others. So they don't get less, they get more, but he has to be first. And if you love him, here's a test. Are you feeding his lambs? Are you tending his sheep? Are you feeding his sheep? Well, Peter says something, I think probably even Jesus was floored to hear. Lord, you know all things. Who would have thunk that could ever come out of Peter's mouth? But here it is, Lord, you know all things. The one who said, Lord, you don't know. You don't know me. You don't know what's going to happen. I won't let that happen to you. And now he's saying, Lord, you 
know all things. I hope you come that far. Well, back in Luke, and we have to get back there because we need to conclude. Luke twenty two forty four, he says to them, we're back with the disciples. These are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scripture. This is my continuing prayer for me, for you, for those we are reaching out to and sharing with, that Jesus will open the eyes of our heart to see him, that he would open our understanding to really comprehend his word. And then he said, thus it is written, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you were endued with power from on high. Repentance and remission of sins. As we preach the good news that Christ died for our sins, we can't forget to tell people they have to repent of those sins. It's repent and believe the good news. It's turning from that sin and putting our trust in him. And he says, we'll experience remission of sins, forgiveness and cleansing and and the sin no longer will dominate and devastate our lives. And he says it's to be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We're gonna see that that's exactly where we go in the book of Acts. It all starts there. And for us, it all starts here. And then he says, I send the promise of my father upon you, but you wait for that power. What's the power he promised that the father would send the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see again as we go through Acts, how important it is that we're empowered supernaturally to do the work of ministry. And he led them out, verse 50, as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Mark 16, 19 adds where he sat down at the right hand of God. Acts 1, 9 says they were just kind of staring up into the sky as they see him caught up in the clouds and he's gone. They just keep staring into heaven. And the angels appear and say, what are you guys doing? Just standing around staring into heaven. It says this same Jesus who you saw go taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go This same Jesus, we'll get to see it in our study of Acts 1. It's the same one who made us and became one of us and suffered and died for us and and rose again the third day and poured out his spirit upon us. That same Jesus is coming again. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Luke concludes and we conclude and they worshiped him. Oh, that's the key, you see. If he's on the throne of our hearts and minds, if, if he is the one we are worshiping, not alongside, but instead of anyone or anything else, every blessing will follow. They worshiped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Pastor Sam took us into the book of Acts for a few verses in today's study. In particular, let's read Acts 1.11 once again, where two angels appeared to the disciples who had just seen Jesus depart into the clouds. Now one of them said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now as we continue to wait for his return, there's a couple of verses I want to share with you. Out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, we're told, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, when he comes to get his children, he will not only retrieve us, but he will change us. And the biggest change is we will be made incorruptible. Incorruptible by what? Sin and death. Sin and death will never again hold sway over us. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.